Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Gagno Atelier. I'm your old pal, Tim Gagno, and this is the Illuminated Messiah Bible Study Online Small Group. All right, and we are live. This is so exciting. Welcome to the program. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And it's Valentine's Day. It's a big day, uh, but I'm so glad that you are on here joining me live as we dive into this Bible study. Today is also Ash Wednesday. And so Ash Wednesday is the traditional beginning of the 40 day season leading us up to Easter Sunday. It's a time of repentance. It's a time of contemplation as we prepare our hearts for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, his death, and more importantly, his resurrection that redeems us and saves us from our sins. And so we just think about that. And I couldn't think of a better time to launch our very first Bible study on the Illuminated Messiah Bible. If you haven't gotten your copy yet, you'll have all kinds of opportunities to grab a hold of this between now and Easter Sunday. Every Wednesday, we're going to be going live at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time in this Bible study. And so every Wednesday, tune in, do me a favor, um, tell your friends about it. Let's get all kinds of people in here uh, talking about Jesus, our Messiah, tearing into the scriptures and doing a deep dive in our Bible study. We so appreciate that. It means a lot. So here's how it's going to work. We're going to have two segments and we're going to talk about art. We're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about uh, the illuminated Messiah. We're going to have guests come on, uh, not today, but in on the coming episodes. We're going to have special guests from the art world and also from the church world uh, that are going to come on and talk to us. And then we're also going to have our, our, our major Bible study uh, towards the second half. And that's going to be really, really exciting. So I hope that you'll stay uh, tuned for all of that. There's something else, though, that's really exciting. Every week, we are going to have giveaways. Giveaways are awesome things. And so let me show you what we're going to do. Every week, we are going to give away official Illuminated Messiah merchandise. That's right. And I don't mean the, just any Illuminated Messiah merchandise. I'm giving you guys the good stuff, like the really awesome stuff. We, we spare no expense, as they said in Jurassic Park. And so let me just show you what this week's giveaway is. Check this out. This is the Eternal Lord, and it is uh, the very first illuminated manuscript uh, type art that I ever did. This is the inspiration. This is the piece of art that inspired the illuminated Messiah Bible. I painted this several years ago. And when I did this, I was experimenting with illuminated manuscripts. I was getting to know the art form. And as I did it, I created this piece of art and I loved it so much. And it touched so many people that I was like, I have got to go deeper with this. And that's where the illuminated Messiah Bible comes from. It's this very piece. This is, it's not a poster. This is an official uh, G clay art print. It's a very high end art print. And, uh, we're going to send this to you. If you win, all you have to do to be eligible to win this 16 by 20 G clay art print is like, and share this broadcast, uh, subscribe to us, um, you know, like the page and all of those things. If you're watching us on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button and hit the, um, the notification bell. And you're eligible. That's all it takes. If you're watching on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, just like and share. We want to get all kinds of people studying the Bible with us. And so if you want to become eligible to win the Eternal Lord painting, 
um, this is your chance to do that. So again, like and share is all you have to do. So with that said, we're going to go into our first commercial and then we're going to come back with our first segment. The Illuminated Messiah Bible is a collection of 66 portraits of Jesus from every book in the Bible. Every Messianic theme from Genesis to Revelation has been illuminated alongside commentaries explaining the theology behind every one of my brushstrokes. In this small group online Bible study that we're doing, we will look at the paintings and the passages that they illuminate. Then, as a group, we're going to contemplate and discuss our promised Messiah. What did he represent in days past? What does he mean for us today? And most importantly, what does the Messiah mean for eternity? So what is an illuminated manuscript Bible? An illuminated Bible is an extravagant handcrafted codex that incorporates calligraphy, illustrations, and gilding, gold, silver, platinum leaf. Created by a team of scribes and artists working tirelessly for an average of 10 years. Illuminated manuscripts were not always Bibles, commentaries, canon tables, genealogies, even political and legal documents like marriage certificates are also treated with this art form. While the art form can trace its origins back into the Babylonian Talmud around 500 BC, Christian illuminated manuscripts date back to the late Roman Empire under Constantine's reign with a boom period during the Carolingian dynasty of Emperor Charlemagne in the 8th century. The most famous of these works is the Book of Kells, which was created on a remote monastery in the Scottish island of Iona in the 9th century. It's considered by most historians to be medieval Europe's greatest treasure. The Book of Kells contains the four Gospels. It contains Gospel summaries evangelist biographies, and canon tables. The centerpiece of the book is the masterful Chi Rho, which are the first letters of the word Christ in ancient Greek. The artwork on this page, it's this swirling, almost psychedelic design of extremely. Now, with the creation of the printing press in 1440, illuminated manuscripts kind of faded into obscurity. They went the way of the dinosaur, if you will. The first modern illuminated manuscript Bible was created by calligrapher Donald Jackson and commissioned by the Benedictine monks of St. John's University in 1998. Completed in 2011, the St. John's Bible is an artistic masterpiece with 160 illuminations across seven volumes covering the Old and the New Testament and the Apocrypha. Uh, it's written in the New Revised Standard Version, Catholic edition, uh, and it was handcrafted from quill pens, colored inks with gold and platinum leaf on vellum. Uh, the second modern illumination was created by Makoto Fujimura, uh, it's called the Four Holy Gospels, and it includes five paintings across four volumes in the traditional Japanese Nihonga style. The Illuminated Messiah Bible, on which this Bible study course is based, is a truly unique illumination in three specific areas. While previous illuminations used abstract, non-representational art, at least the modern ones, 
The Illuminated Messiah Bible uses figurative narrative paintings in the realist style. The work is done in oils and acrylic paint on gilded 8 by 10 inch panels. Number two, uh, it's the only illuminated Bible ever to have a theme. In this case, Jesus the Messiah. 66 original illuminations depicting the messianic theme from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus in every book of the Bible. And thirdly, each of the 66 illuminations, while remaining standalone artwork, combine together to form what we call in the art world a polyptych image, revealing a hidden, larger-than-life portrait of the crucified Christ. This cross stands 12 feet high and 9 feet wide. Now, this begs the question, who or what is the Messiah? Well, the word Messiah is the Hebrew word Mishiach. Now, you may be more familiar with the Anglican version of that word, Christ. Both of those words, Mishiach and Christ, translate as anointed one. This is a title, not a last name. This is a title for that special descendant of Eve prophesied in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, who will restore the broken relationship between God and man. The ancient Hebrews understood that the Messiah would be God in human flesh living among mankind. Now, Christians have historically believed that the first century Jew, Jesus of Nazareth, is that long-promised Messiah. So what is a messianic prophecy? Well, throughout the Old Testament, God offers humanity glimpses of this anointed one. What was Messiah's mission? How would the people recognize him? What would he say and do? Now, these are not vague oracles or horoscopes. One of the unique aspects of messianic prophecies is their incredible complexity. The odds of one person fulfilling just a single messianic prophecy is astronomical. For example, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. He would live for a time in Egypt grow up in Nazareth, and minister from Galilee in Capernaum. He would be born of a virgin, ride into Jerusalem on a young donkey as the common folk proclaimed him to be their king and Messiah, and be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He would be a man like Moses, a member of the tribe of Judah, and a descendant of King David. The circumstances of his suffering and death are prophesied with such overwhelming detail that there is only one human to ever live that could possibly fit this pattern, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, both Christians and Jewish theologians agree that there are 73 key Old Testament prophecies that are 100% messianic in nature. Mathematician Peter Stoner explained in his book, Science Speaks, that the odds of one first century man fulfilling just eight Messianic prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. That's the number 10 with 17 zeros behind it. He then calculated one first century man fulfilling 48 Messianic prophecies. The odds of that are a mind-boggling 1 in 10 to the 157th power. That's right, the number 10 with 157 zeros behind it. That'd be like winning the lottery eight times in a row. Or more. <laughs> the New Testament references Jesus of Nazareth fulfilling not just the 73 that we all agreed on, but even more than that. Jesus of Nazareth fulfills them all. 
You can find a list. This is cool. One of the best things about the Illuminated Messiah Bible. You can find a list of 44 of these Old Testament prophecies and their direct fulfillment in the New Testament in the back of the Illuminated Messiah Bible. Are Messianic passages relevant for today? Absolutely. Only God can accomplish the miracles found within the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. It is one of the many validations that the Bible is the Word of God and that Jesus of Nazareth is our long-promised Messiah. In ancient times, God revealed this hope through his prophets. And for us living today, their fulfillment is confirmed in Jesus. What a glorious tapestry that God has weaved across time and scripture for those who believe in the name of Jesus. What a powerful testimony to those that have yet to believe. So here's the question for our discussion in the comment section below. As you study the Messianic passages over the next few weeks in this Bible study small group, what do you hope to learn? Write your answer in the comment section below, share it with the group, and be sure to comment uh, on each other's posts. And let's get that discussion started. everybody. Well, welcome back. I mean, that was some good stuff. So that's where we're going here. So now we're going to go into section two. But before we do that, I want to remind you of this over there. It's over there. It's over here. It's over there. <laughs> but uh, this is our gift for today. This is the big prize that we're going for. One of you is going to win this beautiful 16 by 20 fine art gclay print of my painting the eternal lord which is the absolute inspiration for the illuminated messiah bible this is the painting that launched it all and so you can get your print of that all you have to do to become eligible to win is to like and share this broadcast and Tell your friends about it. If you like and share, I'm going to see that and you're going to be in the running. We're going to announce the winner next Wednesday on, on the uh, during the Bible study uh, next Wednesday. But um, tell your friends about us. Tell your friends about this. We want a ton of people to join in and uh, we want to see lots of comments in the comment section as we go into now the meat of this Bible study. And so what we're going to be talking about right now is the Messiah of Moses, the Messianic themes from the Torah. Now, the Torah or the Pentateuch contains the first five books of the Bible. Tradition holds that they were originally written by Moses based off of the oral traditions of the Hebrews. It's the foundation of both the Judeo-Christian faiths and all of Western civilization. In these scrolls, Moses chronicles the very first references of the Messiah, detailing his purpose and his person. In the Illuminated Messiah Bible, I illuminate five passages, one from each one of these books, as we reveal the Messiah of the Torah. And so our first one, here's the painting from it. And it is obviously the book of Genesis. The very first messianic prophecy is 
right here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And uh, it says this, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You know, in all creation, human beings are, are unique in both our original form and function. Until we screwed it all up, right? <laughs> uh, not that we didn't have help. I mean, the serpent certainly helped. But that's where it gets interesting. The fascinating aspect of the fall of mankind is that it is almost identical to the fall of Lucifer. The crime in both cases is to become like God. You can check that out by comparing Genesis chapter 3 and Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. God's uh, position and power and authority were being rebelled against, and the rebellion screamed, I don't need God, I can be God. To illegally take God's position, his power, and his authority by sheer force of will. You're not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to tell me and you what I'm going to do. This didn't end well. It didn't end well for Adam. It didn't end well for Eve. It didn't end well for the serpent. All three were cursed. But it's in the serpent's curse that we get our very first glimpse of Messiah. Though the consequences were incalculable, God promised that one of Eve's descendants would destroy the works of the serpent, restoring the broken relationship between God and humanity. This will be accomplished at great cost after hundreds of generations of hostility between two warring factions. Messiah will restore human beings to their original position at the apex of God's creation. Now, the ramifications of this first messianic prophecy, they set the tone for everything in the whole of Scripture and the overarching story of mankind. Grace, the unmerited, incomprehensible favor and love of God towards humanity. A grace that was denied the serpent and those who fell alongside him. So what makes humans so special? The angels can't figure it out, according to 1 Peter. And when King David looked up at the night sky and he asked in the 8th Psalm, what is man that you are mindful of him? So this leads us to our first question. And our first question is right here. And again, Write these down in the comments. Let's get that discussion going. If you just scroll down on this video, you'll see the comments. You can start typing in these questions and comments. So here's question number one. How do you feel knowing that God provides forgiveness and restoration through the Messiah to humanity alone? What does this special grace mean to you and how does that impact your life choices? That's a good question, Tim. Why'd you go so deep? I know we went deep. That's what we're doing here. We're trying to go deep into the Bible and bada bing, bada boom, here we are. So that's our first one from the book of Genesis. So now let's go to our next one. And that is the book of Exodus. And here is the painting from the book of Exodus. I got to tell you, this is one of my favorites. I absolutely love this painting. It just fires me up every time I see it. And here is what it says. We're talking about the Passover lamb's blood. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 13, and it says, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You know, as the final plague of Egypt looms, God commands the Hebrew people to cover the lintels and the doorposts of their homes with the blood of a lamb as a sign 
of their devotion to God. This painting is a landscape with the great pyramids. I mean, what better representation of the grandeur that was ancient Egypt, right? But in the background, we have an abstract splatter of deep red representing the blood of that Passover lamb. This passage obviously foreshadows Jesus as our Passover lamb. Through Messiah's blood, we are saved from eternal destruction, redeemed and given the gift of eternal life. And so here comes our next question, guys. Here it is, question number two, based off of Exodus. When you think about your sins, how do you feel knowing that through Messiah's shed blood, Jesus' shed blood, that you will escape the wrath of God? And that's a deep question, and that's something that we all need to think about. So what do you think about that? Write it in the comments below, and let's get that conversation going even deeper. All right, and so here we go. Here is our next one, and it is the book of Leviticus. And here's another one I like. <laughs> I love painting two things more than anything. I love to paint babies. Babies are just super cute and they're fun to paint those big fat chubby fingers. And uh, they're just adorable to paint babies. But I also love painting sheep and goats. They are adorable animals. And I don't know why. I just think they're cute and fun. And they, they're hilarious, make me laugh. So here we go. We've got, we have got the scapegoat here. And so this is Leviticus 16.10. And it's about the scapegoat going into the wilderness. Leviticus 16, 10, it says, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now, the day of atonement, uh, more commonly known today as Yom Kippur, marks the day that God forgave the Hebrews for the sin of worshiping the golden calf. You may remember that story. Um, it's a time of fasting, confession, and forgiveness, which is kind of amazing because if you think about it, that's exactly what Lent is. You know, Christians, we celebrate Lent. The Jews celebrate Yom Kippur. And we have in Lent, starting with Ash Wednesday today, it's a time of repentance, fasting, and seeking the forgiveness of God. We're preparing our hearts for the coming of Messiah. And so it's, it's a pretty neat parallel here. Now, in ancient times, the Jewish high priest would take two goats and cast lots over them. One goat was sacrificed to the Lord as a sin offering, and the other was declared the scapegoat. The high priest would lay hands on the scapegoat and speak the transgressions, the iniquities, and the sins of the people over it. It was then led into the wilderness, carrying with it the sins of the people. And I find it interesting because in the first chapter of John's gospel, John the Baptist sees his cousin, Jesus of Nazareth, alongside the shores of the Jordan River. Shouting to his disciple, John declares, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so here we are now with question number three, everybody. So let's look at question number three. And it says, how do you feel when you realize that Jesus has taken your sins upon himself and carried them away? Write your comments, uh, write your answers, start a conversation about this question and the book of Leviticus uh, in the comments below. I can't wait to see them. And so I'm excited to, to see everything that everybody's writing. And now we go to our next one. And this one is the book of numbers. And so here we go. This is the painting from the book of numbers. This is probably the most abstract piece of art in the entire illuminated Messiah Bible. And it's numbers 1414. And it says this. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, are among his people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face. 
and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of, of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. When the Hebrews were wandering in the wilderness, God guided their every step. During the intense heat of the day, he led them as a pillar of a cloud. And in the darkness of night, he led them as a pillar of fire. God himself led and protected his people 24 hours a day, seven days a week for four decades. Even when they sinned and they didn't deserve it. Whenever they would stop and pitch camp, this pillar of cloud and fire would hover over the tabernacle. And it was here that God would commune with Moses. God's presence was ever with his people. Now, these pillars of clouds and fires were a powerful testimony to the other pagan people groups that were living in the area. The God of the Israelites not only dwelt among them, but he was seen, at least by Moses, face to face. Now, who exactly was in that pillar of fire and cloud that met with Moses in the tabernacle? Well, Exodus 14, verse 19, tells us that the angel of God indwelt the fire very likely the same angel that spoke to Moses from the burning bush. Christian theologians consider this very unusual angel found throughout the Old Testament to be what we call a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus the Messiah in the Old Testament. So this painting is in many ways an abstract composition, splitting the panel right down the vertical center with warm and cool colors. In the area of the flames, I purposely allow much of the gold leaf underneath to remain visible, and it creates a really dramatic effect. So when you're looking at this live, like if you're looking at this in person at one of our exhibits, you kind of turn your head and the fire actually starts to, starts to move around a bit. It's really cool. So now let's look at our fourth question. And here we go. This is question number four. When you think about God covering you, throughout the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life, what comes to mind? How does that impact your life choices? And that's a good one. <laughs> I got to think about that one a lot. That's kind of deep for me. And, you know, God covers me through everything. And there, there's been a lot of good, bad, and ugly in my life, just like probably yours. Um, if you haven't had any of that kind of an experience, you haven't been on this earth very long. That's what that tells me. But God is always there with us. And that's a, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. All right, well, let's keep going. This is the last painting uh, from today's uh, Bible study. And here it is, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Now, what's ex exciting about this particular piece is this particular piece, and I'm going to hold this up to the camera as best I can. In the Illuminated Messiah Bible, Every one of the paintings combined together and they form this giant 12 foot cross. But if you get all the way to Deuteronomy and you look, Deuteronomy right there is Jesus's toes. And so if you look behind Moses in the water, the, the water exploding above him, the blue, dark blue area, those are Jesus's toes. So this is the first image in all of the 66 paintings that becomes a body part in the polyptic image of Jesus on the cross. So that's kind of neat. Um, but Deuteronomy, the Messianic theme here is, he will be a man like Moses. It's Deuteronomy 18.15, and it says this, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. You know, the Bible introduces us to a lot of heroes of the faith. John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, King David, Esther. Um, but you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody who has influenced mankind more than Moses. Um, Exodus 33, 11 tells us that the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. 
Moses's close personal relationship with God was unparalleled until Jesus, the Messiah, strode upon the earth. This Messianic passage declares that the Messiah will be a man like Moses. That's a bold statement. It's even bolder when you consider that Moses wrote Deuteronomy. <laughs> he wrote that passage. Um, that's bold. The Messiah would be an Israelite and a prophet whose relationship was God was just like that between Moses and God. He will say only what the Father tells him to say, and God will judge anyone who refuses to listen to him. Well, nearly 1,600 years later, Jesus confronts the religious leaders in Jerusalem, and he says to them, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. And so here's our final question of the night. And here it is, everybody. Question number five. Knowing that Jesus was a man like Moses, what relational attributes can we find between Moses and God that are worth emulating in our own lives? What can you apply to your life from that? Now, that's pretty deep. That's a huge Bible study all by yourself. I mean, that'll make you dive into the Bible for, for the rest of your life. Moses' relationship with God and what relational attributes can we find in there that we should emulate? That's powerful stuff. And I think it's really exciting to try that. Uh, in my church, we're doing a, uh, a six-week small group Bible study on the friend of God, Abraham. And we're doing pretty much the same thing, looking at the life of Abraham and trying to see God called him friend. What can I glean from that relationship that they had and apply to my life? And that's what this passage here is telling us as well. What did Moses know that we don't know? And how do we learn to know that? Well, that's pretty exciting stuff. Well, guys, that's going to wrap up this Bible study. I am so glad that you joined us. Um, just want to remind you one more time to like and share uh, this broadcast and tell your friends about this Bible study. Over the next couple weeks between now and Easter, every Wednesday at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time, we're going to be diving into the Word of God, and we're going to be having a great time doing it as we look at the beautiful art from the Illuminated Messiah Bible, and we contemplate those Messianic passages that link the Old Testament and the New Testament and reveal to us Jesus, our promised Messiah. And so again, guys, don't forget to like and share uh, this broadcast. Like and share the Gagno Atelier pages uh, on Instagram, on YouTube, on Facebook, as well as the Illuminated Messiah page on Facebook as well. And that will make you eligible to win this beautiful 16 by 20 G. Clay art print of my painting, The Eternal Lord. So, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for all of the, my friends that have joined us for this uh, Bible study where we seek you um, and we seek you in your word and we seek you in the scriptures and we try to find our promised Messiah and what that means to us. God, I pray a blessing over everybody that was with me live and everybody that's been that's going to watch it uh, over the next week and, and months. God, we just thank you for who you are. And we ask that you continue to reveal yourself so that we can be drawn deeper and closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching, everybody. And always remember, God loves you, and so does your old pal, Tim. We'll talk to you next time.